Good morning. My name is Angela Robbins. On behalf of the Department of History, Political Science, and International Studies, and the School of Arts and Humanities, thank you so much for joining us. We're excited to bring you this program today. We would especially like to thank our Meredith event staff, Eric Leary, Caitlin Toxie, Jenny Martin, and Bill Brown for helping us coordinate this webinar and making sure everything goes smoothly today. In addition to its likelihood to go down as one of the most challenging years in all of our lives, 2020 is also the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, which gave women in the United States the right to vote. This was a hard fought victory that came only after years of struggle, and we have been commemorating this anniversary throughout this year. At the same time, we recognize that the 19th Amendment was not a victory for all women. Women of color in the United States, including African American women, Native American women, and Chinese immigrants, were still disenfranchised or prevented from voting, either because they were not allowed to become citizens or because of poll taxes and literacy tests, which made it nearly impossible for them to vote. It would be another 45 years before all American women would be eligible to cast a ballot following the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Their history reminds us how the right to vote is not guaranteed, even in a democracy, and how precious the right to participate in the political process is. Today's program is part of our year-long observance of both the possibilities and the limits of the 19th Amendment and a woman's right to vote. And election 2020 will certainly give us more opportunities to talk about the impact of women's votes. Our speakers today, address women's political status and the influence of women voters, professional women, and women political candidates and office holders over the past 100 years. We welcome your questions for each of our speakers today. If you toggle over the menu bar, you may type your questions directly into the Q&A box um, or into the chat. Our first speaker today, Joshua Channon, is a housing director and adjunct professor of history at Texas A&M University Commerce, which just happens to be the alma mater of our provost, Matthew Puzlesny, so it really is a small world. Originally from London, England, Mr. Channon received his master's degree in American history from the University of Texas at Arlington. His research focuses on the history of women and education in Texas during the Progressive Era. Mr. Channon is the author of the forthcoming book, Sally Brooke Capps, Education Trailblazer in North Texas. He joins us today to share his research on Sally Brooke Capps and another Texan suffragist, Annie Webb Blanton, both of whom gained considerable influence and power through their suffrage activism and their right to vote. Welcome, Mr. Channon, and thank you for being here today. Thank you for the warm introduction, Dr. Robbins. Uh, many thanks to the Meredith College's Department of History, Political Science and International Studies for their generous hospitality. I was supposed to travel to North Carolina um, to see all the sites of the East Coast. And um, of course, I heard that you guys had pretty good food out there and I love my food, especially when I live in Texas at the moment, Southern food, Southern comfort food. Uh, however, COVID delayed my plans. So uh, today I'm reaching out to you via Zoom, virtual, and, uh, um, and thank you to everyone who, um, uh, you know, is here on the virtual platform. Uh, I really greatly appreciate it, and we all greatly appreciate it too, uh, especially during these challenging times. Uh, Texas and its political and cultural institutions underwent dramatic changes at the end of the 19th century and in the early decades of the 20th century. The economy was roaring back from the gloomy days of the Civil War and progressive politics uh, became prevalent in daily routine. Um, Sally Brooke Capps and Annie Webb Blanton were white women who grew up and became part of this rejuvenated Texas story. Capps received a high school diploma from North Texas Female College in Sherman prior to moving to Fort Worth where she shaped up the status quo in the classroom by funding and operating one of the first kindergarten teacher training colleges in the American South for ambitious women. 
Capsus's, Capsus's reformist influences spread to various groups after her marriage to William Capps, and William Capps was a prominent attorney and builder of Fort Worth when Fort Worth was becoming, uh, you can say, a major metroplex at the turn of the century. Um, and she was uh, basically known to um, mix with a lot of uh, high groups in Fort Worth, uh, the elites, you can say. In 1911, Katz was selected by Governor Oscar Branch Coquit uh, to serve on the Board of Regents at the College of Industrial Arts in Denton, which is today Texas Women's University in Denton. She served there um, for 18 long years, and that was Texas's first state-supported college for women. On the other hand, Blanton, Annie Webb Blanton, who had seven siblings, but she was the only one that went into education, acquired a Bachelor of Literature degree. So uh, instead of a high school diploma like Caps, she went to college, uh, which was very unusual for women at that time, at the turn of the 20th century. Um, and she went to the University of Texas at Austin, and she started her career as a public school teacher on the outskirts of Austin. She moved to Denton in 1901 at the turn of the century and was hired as an English professor at North Texas State Normal College, which is today the University of North Texas in Denton, where she took special interest in mentoring female students in campuses, in the campuses literature club and also the local women's uh, Shakespeare club too. So while Caps and Blanton were cementing their public service careers at first rate higher institutions, uh, the suffrage movement in Texas was slowly gaining momentum. At the state level, the Texas Equal Suffrage Association, the TESA, headed by the feisty Houstonian Annette Finnegan, mobilized a large grassroots campaign in the state's major cities, including Dallas, Houston, San Antonio, and Galveston. The organization, whose members believed that barring women from voting was unjust, paraded the Capitol steps in Austin and tirelessly penned letters to the state representatives, requesting them to hold a voters referendum on the subject of white suffrage. Moreover, the Texas State Teachers Association, the TSTA, shared much of the same platform as the Equal Suffrage Association and argued for equal professional opportunities for competent white middle-class women in academia. Blanton was one of the many North Texas, Texas educators who were heavily invested in the TSTA and helped host large annual conventions which addressed overriding topics such as, quote, women as school board members and, quote, equal pay for equal work, which unfortunately in some cases we still don't have and women should, you know, they deserve equal pay. Locally, the Dallas Equal Suffrage Association, the DESA, so there's a lot of acronyms here, but the DESA, principally comprised of young college women and young matrons, uh, but, uh, domestic uh, mothers, were established, uh, was established at a private home on March the 15th, 1913. The organization strived uh, to secure the vote for white women and, quote, to clean up politics, to raise the standards of public life, and to apply the values of home and family to community problems in Dallas. So they wanted to clean up society. They knew politicians, like most politicians today, were corrupt, and they wanted to change that. DESA members tailored their progressive, colorful campaign to the fairly conservative uh, communities in Dallas, and frequently wrote newspaper articles, distributed promotional materials on the streets, and presented their justified argument to other North Texas organizations to drum up support. They excitedly formulated their reasoning to explain why women's roles should expand beyond the private sphere, should expand beyond uh, the household name. Historian Elizabeth York Enstam noted that the grand positive ramifications of this expansive campaign. She said, mothers could help shape the world for their children, employed women could vote for candidates who have supported laws for improved working conditions and higher wages and more immediately activist club women would have new power for sensitizing for lawmakers to the effects of policy on public life 
and private life in the home. Sally Brooke Caps was actively involved in the local campaign, passing out flies to bystanders in Dallas and Fort Worth. She lived in Fort Worth. Remember, she got married to Fort Worth attorney William Caps, as well as enthusiastically chatting about suffrage with interested students at the College of Industrial Arts in Denton. Since the Lone Star State suffrage movement challenged the local um, and the long established social arrangements and threatened people's deep assumptions about their daily lives, there was much opposition, of course. Politicians turned a blind eye to bills that would benefit women, while white patriarchs would install fear and strength in the household. The man needed power. In an effort to reduce public aggression and generate a degree of acceptance, the DESA, the Dallas Equal Suffrage Association, embarked on the idea of campaigning at local social uh, occasions, the perfect locations to disperse their unconventional message among jubilant and sometimes intoxicated partygoers. The State Fair of Texas in the city of Dallas, an annual carnival that was chartered 50 years after Texas's independence from Mexico in 1886, provided camouflage for the suffrage cause. I don't know if any of you all have been to the Texas State Fair. I have lived in Texas now for 16 or 17 years, and I have not been to the Texas State Fair yet in Dallas. Uh, and I need to go. I've heard there's a lot of good foods, fried foods. You know, they had fried mashed potatoes, uh, cookie dough, even fried peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And I'm not really a big fan of that. So, uh, but I need to go. So if you are ever in Texas, go to the State Fair. But in 1913, over 30,000 Bankers, working class laborers, homemakers, business owners, farmers, politicians, and children attended the state fair that year. Mostly, they went multiple times. So it was a very popular event. The state fair was a hub of activity which breathed patriotism, vigor, and life. The DESA woman decorated a booth with promotional posters, dressed in simple yet elegant white garments, and waved bright yellow flags proclaiming votes for women, conversed with all walks of life, and hosted state, uh, state suffrage events there at the state fair. As president of the Fort Worth Kindergarten Association, a growing organization which promoted the establishment of nurseries, kindergartens, in local school district, CAPS was instrumental in the establishment of kindergartens in Texas. Caps heavily influenced her colleagues to join the DESA campaign and contribute um, at the State Fair. The Fair Park festivities in 1913 were a resounding success, as the DESA were able to subtly um, argue alternative, even insurgent ideas to the public. The DESA continued to have their political booth at the State Fair in 1914, 1915, 1916, and 1970 for five years. A group of historians believe that one day in 1915, suitably named Suffrage Day, was perhaps the largest gathering of suffrage advocates at the State Fair. The Dallas Morning News, which is still around to this very day, the news outlet, reported a group of DSA members, which included a boisterous caps, uh, and she notes that in her diary, met 300 TESA, so the state delegates, um, at the train station and drove them to fancy hotels on that day in parade carts that were clad with yellow pennants. Following a much enjoyed lunch, the suffragists spread their coverage throughout the fair park and addressed the crowds through open top cars, which for Dallas's Time Herald, another news outlet, hailed as, quote, the most unique public speaking event in Dallas. Moreover, the woman exhibited an unladylike boldness by drafting men. They actually had the support of males into their movement. Now, most of these males were the husbands of the suffragist members. However, some were just ambitious to progress Texas forward. Every trails, a traveling salesman at the state fair on that energetic day was persuaded to wear a bright yellow votes for woman pin on their suit jacket lapel. I would love to have one of those pins. The badge wearing men proudly displayed their support for the Texas suffragists as they strolled the fair park and watched the sports and cultural events. 
As we have heard, Texas suffrage organizations, which Sally Katz and Annie Webb Blanton were active participants in, cleverly used the state fair as an outlet to unroll their radical yet ethical campaign. The woman gradually attracted a mass of supporters and illuminated the pressing political issue of the era. The suffragists not only made significant progressive strides in the streets, but also turned their heads of the many congressmen in the Texas chambers. After Governor James Ferguson's bitter dispute with the University of Texas's administration in September 1917, the state Senate found Ferguson guilty of 10 of 21 charges and basically booted him out of office with the help from the suffragists. James Ferguson was an anti-suffragist. He did not believe in votes for women and the TESA and the DESA allied with angry politicians and booted him out of office. They created their own campaign, which was called the Women's Campaign for Good Government. Uh, so they launched this crusade, Ferguson was impeached and resigned on September the 24th, 1917. His successor was the Lieutenant Governor, William P. Hobby, a very handsome guy, uh, loved flirting with the ladies and was then 39 years old. He was the youngest man to hold Texas political office in the governor's mansion and still is. He moved into the governor's mansion and despite Hobby's pre-existing weak stance and suffrage because he had joined the Ferguson ticket, he was willing to change. And the suffragists approached this young man with a very friendly, approachable face. And the renowned Minnie Fisher Cunningham, who was big in Texas uh, women's suffrage and big in Texas politics at that time, and Anna, Anna Pennybacker introduced Blunton to Hobby. Blunton was extremely instrumental in this course. Blunton would of note, I have never seen a more handsome gentleman. That is right, Hobby was a very handsome gentleman. Struck a deal, and they struck a deal with the young governor. If Hobby and his supporters in the Capitol Chambers were to endorse a state law that would permit white women in Texas to vote in the state primaries, then the suffragists would help Hobby get re-elected. Hobby at that time, even when Ferguson was impeached, he came back, came running back, wanting more of the office, um, but Hobby defeated him in a re-election bid in 1918. The pact was made and William Hobby won with a landslide with the suffrages, you could say crusade, their well oil campaign with 84% of the vote in 1918. During his first full term as governor, Hobby kept his political promises and instituted an aggressive progressive agenda, which included drought relief, state aid for schools and a statewide prohibition bill. Also, Hobby cemented his support among the suffragists when he signed the primary suffrage bill in Texas, a landmark bill with a gold pen, might I add, which he gave to Minnie Fisher Cunningham on March the 26th, 1918, giving Texas white women the right to vote in state primaries and conventions. This was the first state suffrage bill in the American South, a region that had long enforced distinct gender rules and expectations, considering Texas was once part of the ex, you know, once part of the Confederacy and now the ex-Confederacy, this was a major landmark. Since the bill became effective on June the 26th, the suffragists had 17 days, only 17 days, a little less, little more than two weeks, until July 11th to register to vote before the July 27th primaries. Guess how many people or guess how many white women registered to vote after that bill? Over 386,000 white women, and even more because records have been lost here and there, maybe even more. But that number of white women quickly flocked to the registration booths. Shortly after the primary bill uh, was signed, Blanton, who was becoming a force to be reckoned with, with the state's education system, was approached by the TESA and Minnie Fisher Cunningham uh, to, uh, to enter the political arena. Ferguson's inferior comments towards educated people and his, uh, quote, vicious and ignorant support fueled Blanton's ambition to run for political office. Blanton expressed her, uh, her frustration with Ferguson's supporters in the, state, in the state chambers to Minnie Fisher Cunningham. She said, I am not going to sit back anymore uh, with this matter at stake. I don't believe anyone has a right to hamper me in such a matter. 
Yet for North Texas State professor was concerned about the race. She was concerned, she wondered whether she was financially capable to undertake a state race. Moreover, she feared the physical and emotional rigors of the campaign. Male politicians of that time questioned Blanton's stamina as a woman in the workplace and her lack of graduate training. She would eventually um, get a master's degree from UT Austin, but that was much later. If I succeeded, Blanton wrote to a friend, I might help the woman's cause because I have studied for public questions all my life. But I honestly think that if I fail, as it is probable, she wasn't, you know, uh, she, she, like many other women, were doubtful but hopeful. My failure would injure the woman's cause in Texas. Despite these personal doubts and the judgment she received from conservative men, Annie Webb Blunton announced her, uh, announced her campaign for state superintendent on June 1st, 1980. And began, uh, com uh, began her convincing campaign. Um, for state superintendent. The Austin Equal Suffrage Association was one of the first women organizations in Texas to endorse Blanton. They cited Blanton's distinguished career in Denton, noteworthy connections to the suffragists, and Texas's likely possibility to elect a woman to state office, which Colorado and Washington and other Western states had previously done. She said it is especially fitting for the first elective office to be held by a woman should be an educational one, since women are, after all, the chief educators of our youth. As a Southern Democrat, Blanton maintained her professional, positive and assertive attitude in her campaign. She attacked her incumbent, basically saying that he had failed uh, to appoint women to key positions in the state offices. Moreover, Blanton was not like any other politician. She did not lie. And she expressed her desire to remove politics from education and give many tributes uh, to Governor Hobby's people policies. Blanton's speeches reflected a different approach to Texas politics, which included the importance of women's professional competence and the many political and social dangers of incompetent men, especially male politicians. While her headquarters was in Denton, she was teaching at this time as a professor, remember, at North Texas State. Blunton visited five to seven towns a week. She traveled the state, um, all corners of the state. Additionally, she met with Texas suffrage leaders, uh, including James McCollum of Austin and Eleanor Brackenrich of San Antonio. Brackenrich would uh, serve on the College of Industrial Arts Board of Regents uh, with CAPS. The grueling campaign work did not tire Blanton. She had stamina and on July 27th, 1918, Texas woman voted Annie Webb Blanton to become the next state superintendent of public instruction. Blanton received nearly 70,000 votes, securing support for white males and females. She was the first woman and one of the only, uh, you know, one of the only top women on one hand to be elected to Texas statewide, uh, to, te to a Texas statewide office. Blanton had challenged for Texas's patriarchal system and defied all odds. The election was a milestone and like the passage of a primary suffrage bill a few months prior, demonstrated for suffragist movements, persistence and increasing political savvy. When she took office, Blanton came face to face with a splintered school system and inherited much administrative work that needed completion. Blanton's duties as the state superintendent of public instruction included managing school laws, supervising record keeping of school officials, staying informed uh, of educational progresses and approving state school finances. Since she had promised to remove the state's political ties to education, Blanton broke up, quote, the ring, which was a group of male politicians that Ferguson had appointed to make sure the education system was in the political hands. Blanton also promoted gender unity in the State Department of Education, hiring an equal number of men and women to principal divisional posts and encouraged local school districts to better utilize their women educators. The number of women on school boards and county superintendents increased during Blanton's four years in office. In 1920, Blanton stated, quote, if the future of our state is to be worthy of its glorious past, 
We must vitalize our schools. That is still prevalent to this very day. We must vitalize our schools. Our children must be taught by the best, end quote. Although communities appear to recognize and support women administrators, the battle for equalizing salaries uh, was still very prevalent and still very tough. Yet Blanton shut down her critics and helped bring about an average increase of 54% for women teachers in the state of Texas, raising it from $570 a year to $877 a year. Not enough as for male colleagues, but still it was a step forward. Moreover, Blanton convinced her male colleagues in the Texas legislature to pass bills which required county superintendents to previously had been teachers. She also lengthened the school days from 117 days to 136 days um, and expanded the academic services at the University of Texas at Austin, the first state college um, that, you know, uh, that was supported by the Texas legislature. Despite having support uh, from multiple, uh, you know, multiple candidates, uh, multiple people in her office, she refused to run for a third term and she was only in office for four years. That was because she was not a politician and she did not want to hog power. Owing to the suffrage's voice and Annie Webb Blanton's notable reform efforts, women were establishing themselves as leaders in the Texas community. I come to a point now uh, where I talk about uh, the woman suffrage movement at the na national stage and how Texas, um, of course, at the national stage, over 2,000 women uh, picketed in front of the White House because President Woodrow Wilson at that time refused to give voice to uh, Texas woman suffragists. This included an Assembly of Texas. The House of Representatives and the Senate took the right step forward on June the 4th, 1919, where both chambers passed the 19th Amendment to the Constitution, which removed sex as a qualifier for voting. The amendment was then submitted to the state governments for approval, where the Texas legislature convened for a special session and ratified the groundbreaking proposal on June the 28th, 1919. The Texas House had a vote of 96 to 21 in approval. Texas became the ninth state in the nation and the first southern state to ratify this amendment. This was a remarkable feat since a majority of Texans still clung to the rigid de definition of gender roles. It took 14 months for three quarters of the state to ratify the federal amendment and following Tennessee's approval, the Secretary of State, President Woodrow Wilson's Secretary of State, declared for law in effect on August the 26th, 1920. Since gender equity was important to her, Sally Capps cherished the news and expressed her joy in a letter to a friend. She quote, the suffrage bill is historic, a desirable victory for our young woman. As a keen regent, Capps volunteered to spread, uh, to spread the significance of the amendment on the College of Industrial Arts campus in Denton. She preached on women's liberties with representatives from the student government, an organization she passionately helped to create in 1916. Also at her request, the student bulletin at the college on November the 1st, 1921, offered uh, Caps's advice uh, to these new students. She quotes, encouraged middle-class women to learn about finances and state institutions and recommended laws dealing with compulsory education, labor, liquor, divorce, public health, morals, and safety as special areas of concern for women. Caps's instructional efforts prepared for students for future civic engagement. Caps's and Blanton's paths would cross in 1924 when Regent Caps headed a search committee to find the next president of the College of Industrial Arts. Many Texans nominated Blanton for the top office. Blanton had just been the state superintendent. They nominated her for the top office, citing her impressive credentials and outstanding record in state education. Blanton even wrote a congenial letter to Caps and questioned the situation. She said, is it not fitting for a woman should be granted the opportunity of making its success as its president? Since the college was the first female state college in Texas, was it fitting for a woman to be president? Yes, it was. Cap supported this endorsement and persuaded her colleagues on the committee and board of regents to vote in favor of Blunton. Once writing that Blunton is the far-seeking, 
conscientious, adaptable, and worthy of any honor or distinctions which the board or the citizens of Texas might confer upon her. Unfortunately, that was not the case. A majority of the search committee and board of regents, like many other institutions in the United States, at that time, many of the regents were businessmen who only cared about the business side and not about the school side as such. And they shut caps down. This was basically, um, this was basically TWU's own soap opera, you can say, and it's discussed in more detail uh, in my forthcoming book. And unfortunately, the president that the majority of the board chose, Lindsey Blaney, uh, he was a complete mess. Uh, and he resigned in disgrace two years later. Following this disappointment presidential search and an unsuccessful 1922 bid for Congress, Blunton did go for Congress. Unfortunately, she failed on that end too. Blanton's spirit was not dampened as she continued her award-winning teaching career as a professor of education at UT Austin, where she taught for many, many years afterwards. She was an instrumental figure in Texas politics. Caps was an instrumental figure in Dallas politics and Fort Worth politics, local politics. Blanton carried on giving agency to students in the classroom and supporting the careers of women educators as one of the founders of Delta Kappa Gamma a professional society for teachers until her death in 1945. Meanwhile, CAPS continued to endorse curriculum rewrites and physical plant project expansions at the, college, at the College of Industrial Arts until her retirement in 1929. Prior to her death in 1946, so they were born at about the same time, both of them, after the Civil War in the 1860s, 1870s, and they died literally one year uh, between them after World War II, Caps inspired young women to pursue their dreams as qualified teachers, as an educator at the Fort Worth teacher, uh, a kindergarten teacher training school she had established. Texas in the early 20th century, like most of the South, was embedded with standards which only benefited the white man. Patriarchal power had spread its oppressive tentacles in government, churches, homes, and schools. Despite all the odds stacked against them, Sally Brook Caps and Annie Webb Blanton held their chins high, faced the challenges and harassment with persistence, and broke the gender barriers in state politics and education. The 1918 Primary Suffrage Bill and the 19th Amendment were monumental milestones in the state's history and reinforced Caps's and Blanton's goals in encouraging young women to freely exercise their civil liberties and enter the top offices of their uh, professions. It is without doubt that Sally Brooke Caps and Annie Webb Blanton were badass women, each with a defined inspirational mission. Now, might I add, like Dr. Robbins said, the 19th Amendment was a major stepping stone in the history of the United States, equivalent to other progressive events of our time, including the Civil Rights Act of 1964, Roe versus Wade of 1973, and the 2008 election, of course, of our first black president, Barack Obama, sorry. Although significant in many capacities, the amendment was biased and discriminated against black women, Latinas, Native American, and other women of color, women groups who were not white. It would not be until decades later when women of color were finally granted the right to vote. Today, historians commemorate, we don't celebrate, but we commemorate the glorious march towards the 19th Amendment, yet acknowledge the once dark truth behind the law. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Channon. We appreciate that valuable information. I'm reminded when you're talking about Texas that um, we see similar histories when we look at North Carolina and other states where there's a place for women in certain areas of life, but then they're, they're um, prevented or limited in other areas of life. So, it's a great reminder for us all that education was certainly a, a, an opportunity for women to take on these sort of supervisory roles and positions 
Um, but then again, certain fields were closed to them. And, I've, and this is really uh, great information about how hard it was to actually raise the salaries. She was able to do it to some extent for women, but not to a great extent. That reminds us too, as you mentioned, pay equity is still something we're dealing with today. So I guess that's not really a big surprise. Um, we do have one question in the q and I'd like to go ahead and get to first, and then um, we'll see if other, fa other folks on our um, panel have questions. Uh, this comes from one of our attendees. Um, in critical race theory, there is a tenet that describes interest convergence being a dominant social group support for political or social causes of a marginalized group, only if the dominant group benefits in some way. How has the women's vote been marketed in a way that all in society, i.e. getting men on board, would benefit? How has it upheld racism? And uh, she, uh, she said, I'm thinking of recent appeals to suburban, suburban moms, for example. And uh, yes, that, that is a good question, whoever asked it. Um, you know, there is, uh, there's still voter suppression. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, you scratch your head thinking, why is there voter suppression? You know, everyone, that is the civic, uh, that's the civic basic liberty of Americans, the right to vote. And uh, it, for those that are on this panel, and also those that are watching us right now, if you haven't voted, vote. Uh, regardless of what side you are, vote, because that is your civil liberty. You know, I, I bring up uh, this topic in my class, too. There was a black woman in El Paso at this time, um, Maud Simpson Wood. Uh, Maud Simpson, uh, she got married, Maud Simpson Wood. Um, and she was shunned by um, the Texas Equal Suffrage Association and by the National Equal Suffrage Association during this time of the Texas suffrage, uh, suffrage movement because she was black, because she was a woman of color. And she and her followers, which they created their own group, their own black suffrage group in El Paso. And, you know, they um, uh, promoted their campaign in Austin and the state chambers. But unfortunately, she was a woman of color. It is in those times when you're just scratching your head thinking, why is this happening? Even today, when you have voter suppression, why is this happening? When Annie Webb Blanton and Sally Brooke Capps, they, did, they disregarded race as a factor, you can say, in society. It is very disturbing uh, that they did that. However, they had the support of many women who believed that women of color should have their place, and their place was, um, you know, domestic housekeepers. They, their place was not in the state chambers. Even today, we see voter suppression, we see, uh, you know, voter fraud and everything like that. And Annie Webb Blanton and Minnie Fisher Cunningham, uh, Sally Brooke Capps, they did not help. They did not help the cause of women of color. Um, or they did not help the cause of, you know, voter suppression as such. Um, so it comes from those long-standing stigmas that we that, you know, our ancestors created in the 1920s, that still exists to this very day. And that's how they promoted it. They promoted it by, okay, we're only going to lobby for white women, for them to have the right to vote. Mm -hmm. And we're not going to, you know, we're not going to give any say uh, to the other woman. It was very, the white suffrage movement was a white suffrage movement. They were very discriminatory against women of color. And it is very sad uh, to think about it, and that was the stigma that existed during that time. Yeah, it's a it's a um, an important reminder to all of us for sure. Um, do any of our panelists have questions for Joshua? Would you like to jump in? Yeah, um, Professor Chanin, uh, I was curious about what was what if any was the role of the United Daughters of the Confederacy in either supporting or opposing the primary uh, bill, and then Blanton's candidacy within the role of education. Yes, I don't know much about the Daughters of the Confederacy, but I know that they did support uh, Blanton's um, ideals, and they did support her values. Of course, they wanted, um, you know, free speech too. However, 
you know, like I said, because it was all discriminatory in the suffrage movement, when you had fat support, you were, you were scratching your head thinking, oh gosh, you know, is she doing something wrong? Well, in her views, Annie Webb Blunton's views, she thought she was doing something right. She had the white woman support and she got into office. However, in today's world, when you look at it, you're thinking, oh snap, you know, she did have their vote, she did have their support, uh, she received a lot of support from other groups, even when, um, and I go, uh, go into detail about this in my future book, even when Annie Webb Blanton was being endorsed for the presidency of the College of Industrial Arts, she had some very, um, uh, you know, weird endorsements, you can say. And I looked over all those endorsement letters, and some of them were from very racist, uh, what we consider today as very racist groups. Um, the groups that basically had segregation values um, and that wanted to, you know, split the line between, uh, you know, the coloured lines. Um, so she was supported by those groups, yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so we are going to need to move on. Uh, so we make sure that we get um, our other two panelists their time. And what we might be able to do, uh, depending on everybody's availability, is uh, ask questions again of everyone at the end. Um, so let's go ahead um, for our next panelist, um, who is um, Dr. David McLennan. So we're fast forwarding now from uh, the 19th Amendment and gaining uh, white women the right to vote to election 2020 and some of the key issues for North Carolina's voters. Uh, David McLennan is a professor of political science here at Meredith College and, like Mr. Channon, uh, Dr. McLennan did his graduate studies in Texas, uh, in his case at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, Dr. McLennan is a director of the Meredith Poll, the only statewide poll with a focus on women's issues, um, and he's in very high demand on local and regional news broadcasts due to his expertise in the fields of politics, elections, and women candidates for office. So he's here today to talk about the Meredith Poll. Thank you for joining us, Dr. McLennan. Thank you, Angela, and thank you, Joshua. That was a fascinating uh, paper on Texas history. Uh, someone who lived in Texas 10 years, um, I knew very little of that. The most amazing thing you said was that you haven't been to the state fair having lived there 17 years. I thought that was a constitutional amendment. But nonetheless, um, I want to talk about really where we are in 2020 with less than two weeks before Election Day. Many of you have already voted. Some of you have, are yet to vote. But I wanted to focus primarily on women voters in this election and share with you some right off the press news from the Meredith Poll. We just finished collecting data late Monday. So we are going to be pre presenting some information to you that is really, truly embargoed. No one else knows this information. Well, before we talk about Meredith poll results, it's worth noting that um, women comprise 54.2% of registered voters in North Carolina, and that's as of Friday. Um, so again, um, if you think about who the majority of voters are, they are women. But also it's important to look at that bottom chart to realize that in presidential elections, women outvote men. And recently, in a midterm election in 2018, women outvoted men for the first time in North Carolina. So women have a lot of political power in the state. And so despite what um, 100 years ago was the case, now women do control the outcome of elections. And that's going to be my common theme for this particular presentation. If we look at race and ethnicity, and Melissa, I really appreciate your question. It's good to see your name again. It's been a while. Um, this idea of race and ethnicity is a very important question because, as you well know, um, women of color are one of the strongest voting blocks in the country and will be so in 2020. And so if you look at the new voters since 2016, and this is from some research by two political science colleagues at other institutions, Michael Bitzer at Catawba and uh, Chris Cooper at Western Carolina, you see that um, women of color um, have been, uh, excuse me, people of color have been registering at higher rates since 2016 than whites. So the bottom line is that not only prior to 2016, but since 2016, 
the increase in voter registrations of people of color, particularly women of color, is making women's prominence in this election cycle even more important. If we look at women by generation and race, we see that younger generations, the Generation Z and millennials, um, have a higher percentage of um, the electorate, or a higher percentage of the electorate, and also when you factor in race. So again, the story that I'm telling is that uh, North Carolina is a changing electorate, and that is reflected in not only only the Meredith poll, which I'll share with you in just a second, but also in voting results. We've seen um, women of color, we've seen white women, we've seen urban women, suburban women, and rural women take on an increasingly important role in elections, and they will do so this year. Well, here's the information from the Meredith poll that is very recent. There are some very significant gender differences in presidential preference. We're looking at the race between Joe Biden and Donald Trump, obviously. And we've all heard of the gender gap that has been affecting voting preferences over the last couple of decades. Well, it is reflected in North Carolina. Um, what we do see, at least in polling results, is that women do tend to favor Joe Biden and um, men to a um, slight degree are favoring uh, Donald Trump. But what I would point out, and this is worth talking about perhaps in the Q&A session, is what's the difference between 2016 and 2020? And I'll show you that in just a second. But women are moving more to the Democratic candidate, and that would be Joe Biden, obviously, than they did toward the Democratic candidate in 2016, Hillary Clinton. So as we see North Carolina changing, we're also seeing their preferences moving even more strongly toward Democratic candidates. If we break down the results even more along educational and gender lines, um, we see that um, college-educated women are the strongest supporters for Democratic candidates, in this case, Joe Biden. So if we look at who is the most strongly behind Joe Biden at this point in the election cycle, it's college-educated women. But the bar immediately above it, non-college degree women. I'd like you to look at that for a second. If we compare that to 2016 in North Carolina, we saw that uh, Donald Trump got almost 60% of non-college degree women votes. So again, even non-college women are moving more toward the Democratic candidate. Men, the breakdown is obvious, uh, college-educated men are more Democratic-leaning and non-college men are more Republican-leaning. So again, um, it points out that gender gap uh, that exists, but it's also more complex and that education is a real factor. If we look at race and ethnicity, I think you can see quite clearly here that while white women still um, are not um, a majority of Joe, or at least a majority of white women are not supporting uh, Joe Biden at this point, when we look at women of color, black women, Hispanic women, and Asian women very strongly support Joe Biden. And um, again, as we have talked about many times uh, at the national level, but also at the state level, the most consistent voting blocks for Democratic candidates are, in fact, women of color. And um, I don't expect that's going to be any different after November 3rd. So we will see, um, again, whether or not Joe Biden or Donald Trump wins North Carolina and, by extension, wins the presidency. I think if he does win, if Joe Biden does end up being elected president, there's gotta be a huge thank you given to women. And I think despite what Donald Trump is trying to do in the last few weeks of the campaign, trying to appeal to women, particularly suburban women, um, it doesn't appear to be helping at all. Um, our polling results indicate that women from suburban counties in North Carolina um, have switched from Donald Trump to Joe Biden. And so our polling results would indicate, at least as of the 19th of October, that Donald Trump's attempts to win back suburban women by his overt and 
racist appeals are not in fact working. So um, I just want to give you that brief snapshot, not only of what the Meredith poll results are um, from the most, Meredith, uh, most recent Meredith poll, but just to kind of give you a sense for how voters are trending in North Carolina. Thank you, Dr. McLennan. That is always so fascinating to see what North Carolina voters are thinking about everything that's going on. That difference, that gender gap difference is just remarkable to me. Um, it would be interesting to dig down deeper and find out more about that. We do have one question for you in the q and I'd like to read, and this is Melissa Jenkins again. Um, would you say that there is a most common theme prevalent in political ads targeting women voters? I know there's a local one about a senatorial candidate that gets at family values over other themes like access to higher education or pay equity, as it, and has this been consistent for decades? Well, again, we stereotype voters a lot, and I hate to um, uh, talk about what campaigns do because oftentimes they make huge tactical and strategic mistakes. Um, so uh, I'll tell you some other parts of the Meredith poll that indicate what candidates ought to be talking about, and this is relevant to women and women of color uh, in particular. But the number one issue in the election in North Carolina is healthcare. Um, we ask people about their perceptions of the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare, and North Carolinians, men and women, Democrats and Republicans, have very favorable opinions about the Affordable Care Act. We ask them about the importance of health care in terms of their decisions about uh, which candidates to vote for. And again, women in particular, but all, candidate, uh, all voters specifically, uh, indicate health care was their top issue. And so even though you see the president trying to scare women by using appeals to law and order, and you see other candidates talking about family values and a variety of things, at least for the presidential candidates, the governor's candidate, and the Senate candidates, the two top issues are healthcare and the coronavirus response, and you can see why those two are linked. So I would say that anybody who's trying to win the women's vote and don't campaign on the pandemic response and healthcare are really missing the boat. Yeah, that's fascinating. Do we have other questions um, for Dr. McLennan? Maybe one other question, and then we'll um, move on to our third panelist. Oh, I've got one in the Q&A. Um, so this is for you again, Dr. McLennan from Yahaira Ramos Ramirez. Uh, due to the relevance of votes from women and their importance historically or even recently, do you know if there have been attempts in suppressing the female vote? Well, as Joshua indicated, uh, voter suppression has a long history, not only nationally, but in North Carolina. And, you know, it, it's, there's such a range of ways in which voter suppression has been carried out. Um, in North Carolina, we've had fights over the early voting period. We do know that early voting is very important for lots of voters, uh, but particularly women who face not only job pressures, school pressures, childcare pressures, senior care pressures. And so keeping a shorter early voting period is one of the ways that impacts women. Um, there are other things about the location, um, of voting places. So, you know, it's not unique to women, but there are different ways in which um, voter suppression activities do affect women. So again, um, you know, even though, as Joshua said, uh, voting should be a basic right that all citizens have, we know that the reason why campaigns and parties use it is to try to get a tactical advantage. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. McLennan. Um, we are going to go ahead and shift to Dr. Monzo um, for a couple of moments because she needs to get to class and I'm sure other people need to get to class too, but um, those of you who can hold on, uh, if you will, we'll see if folks have other questions. We'd be happy to do that if we um, can. Uh, Dr. Monzo is also a political science professor here at Meredith. She's our pre-law advisor and she's assistant director of the Meredith Poll. And, uh, again, remarkably, also a Texas uh, person. She uh, is from Texas and did her graduate work at Texas, just like Dr. McLennan did, uh, and just like Do um, Professor Channon did. So take it away, Dr. Monzo. Thanks, Dr. Robbins, um, and thank you, Professor Channon and Professor McLennan for um, those great insights for the historical um, nature of the women's vote and then the current nature of the women's vote. 
Um, I don't have a formal presentation. I just um, wanted to make sure everyone saw the report uh, on North Carolina women's voting, um, political participation. Not, uh, so it's not just voting, but also participation broadly. Um, North Carolina got a D, um, so we can do better here. Um, where we're doing well is in women in local boards and commissions, um, but where we're doing poorly is electing women um, to the North Carolina General Assembly. Um, we actually have decreased that number in recent years. Uh, on the flip side, um, there is the possibility that we might have one of the largest um, percent women congressional delegations if all of the women running this fall um, win their races in 2020. So it's kind of a mixed bag in North Carolina about where women are participating and where they're not. Um, but we, uh, the North Carolina Commission on Women and Youth Involvement did three panels on this and it was specifically how to get involved. So I encourage all of our students who are watching to watch those three panels. You, you hear from um, academics like me, but you also hear from real life women serving in North Carolina elected and appointed office with tips on how they got involved, um, what it's like being a woman in politics, and it's all really, really great information. Um, so if you're interested um, on the flyer that Dr. Robbins handed out, um, there's a link to the panel on there. Uh, so I hope that you watch and please reach out if you have any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Monzo. It's really fascinating to see that report. Um, and the panel is really, really interesting. Um, so I would encourage folks, yeah, to, um, to connect to that link and have a listen. Um, and yes, get involved, be involved, vote, take your friends with you when you go vote, <laughs> right? So make sure that we're, uh, that we're engaging in this process and that we're exercising. Uh, this right which as the history reminds us is not guaranteed to us um, and think about running for office one day yeah yeah exactly and what what is it that you and dr mcclennan always say when women run when they win. win yep and that's really really important to remember thank you dr Monza. thanks everybody um so for those of you that can uh hang on uh we have a few more questions perhaps for um, our presenters today. Um, I have one um, uh, for you, Joshua Channon. Um, so, so Texas was the first, you told us, it was the ninth state overall um, to ratify the suffrage amendment, and it was the first southern state to ratify. And of course, we hear this great information about these two particular women who were really working hard for this. But um, can you tell us other things that made Texas stand apart from other Southern states? Why was Texas so special in this regard? Because I'm just gonna tell you, North Carolina didn't ratify the 19th Amendment until 1971. Yeah, it was late. Um, <laughs> I, I would say Texas uh, was kind of like, even during the Civil War, Texas was an, was an outlier, not only geographically, but also because you know, not many people here own slaves. Mm -hmm. Texas was brought in uh, to the Confederacy, um, uh, you know, but, but there was a lot of opposition to, uh, mostly opposition, um, you know, to join the Confederacy, led by Sam Houston himself, uh, when he was governor and then disposed from office uh, because he didn't believe in succeeding from the Union. So um, there were a lot of times when Texas has kind of been you can say straddled between the South and the West. And that is why today we consider Texas as part of the Southwest, um, not only geographically, but also politically. Uh, now, you know, we were talking in the beginning, now Texas might become a swing state. So it doesn't have those same political ideals as the Deep South or what you would today consider, a, you know, very a conservative base. Um, but, uh, it's just weird in general. It's just weird. And uh, of course, Texas, surprisingly, under uh, these women and William Hobby, they passed this amendment uh, through their state chambers um, as the first southern state. And that was probably because Texas was, uh, you can say, a different population. There were more people coming in, um, you know, an influx in it of immigrants. A woman were more 
you can say women on the most part maybe were more educated here in Texas because we did have a lot of junior colleges, not just the College of Industrial Arts, but there were also other junior colleges too. And that's my next project about women junior colleges in Texas at this time. Even when we look at A&M Commerce, this was a very progressive school because when it was founded in 1889, William Mayo, the founder, basically said he's going to open up the classroom to white females and males. And at that time, of course, the schools were segregated by sex. Uh, so this school, A&M Commerce, was very progressive during this time. So I think Texas, it came to a point after the Civil War when there was still a group of people that were clinging on to, you know, you could say patriarchal power. But at the same time, it was very progressive in its politics and in its group mobilization. Very nice. Okay, yeah, that, that helps me understand it, you know, much better. It's just not, um, it doesn't share as many characteristics as other Southern states during this time. And yeah, that, that makes good sense. Very good. Uh, do other, pan, um, other folks on the panel have questions for Professor Channon? I have one, if I could. Um, I, I thank you so much for this great talk. Um, this is so interesting. Um, and my question is uh, a little less about kind of the direct uh, political processes, maybe. Um, it's about a comment that you made sort of in passing early on. You were talking about the, um, the founding of the Dallas Equal Suffrage Association in 1913. And you, you said that part of what they wanted to do was apply um, you know, principles related to home and family to kind of social projects. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that. Oh, so, definitely. You know, do you know specific? Yeah. yeah, so they wanted to basically clean up politics and especially not only politics in the state government in Austin, but also local politics too. Uh, Sally Capps, um, she was instrumental in that movement, you can say, where she recognized that the Fort Worth school board where her children went, Sally Capps and William Capps had three children. All of them grew up to be basically successful professions, uh, professionals themselves. But uh, her, uh, her children went to the Fort Worth schools. And uh, this was about the same time when independent school districts were being established in Texas. Uh, and she saw these Fort Worth schools and she was like, you've got to be kidding me. You know, uh, the schools were run down. They didn't have a, equipment or supplies. And she led this movement and these women led these movements to change politics in a way where, you know, education was at the center of a child's life, you know, because uh, they wanted a great education for their kids. So their campaign was, you know, basically proposing more money for um, hand sanitizers, uh, for drinking cups, for American, even American flags, school supplies and supplies that would make sure that students were getting an adequate education. Um, and so they wanted to not only change politics or the amendment as such and bills, but they wanted to change the local establishments, the schools, the churches. Sally Capps was instrumental in the development of Fort Worth's Baptist Church, and then she would uh, become Presbyterian. But at the same time, it, it's, it's basically those local establishments that were really, you can say, the core of a person's daily life. Uh, and these women were determined um, to focus uh, the political routes uh, on to these daily activities. Okay, that's super fascinating. Can I ask a follow-up question? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, I mean, so I can see clear kind of connections between traditional women's roles for child caring, child, um, re child rearing, and this focus on education. And I'm wondering, um, I mean, these leaders were clearly really passionate about making children's lives and educations better and the state taking a role in that. But I'm wondering also if there, if you feel that there were um, sort of tactical elements of that in a very conservative society of sort of uh, um, making their platform look kind of domestic and look in line with tr traditional sort of women's roles. Yes, yes, yeah, you are exactly right. They needed to get the politician support 
they needed to get their local councilman support and so uh, they played it they played it tactfully um they <clears throat> they you know they were they were they were a rowdy bunch of women you can say they're very bolsterous and you know they wanted change however yes they had to play the playing field um uh, most of the time um when you know of course basically sally caps wanted to establish this fort worth kindergarten teacher training school she had to go before the fort worth school board and say hey look you know i want this teacher training school however we're not going to interfere with male teachers and that was basically what she said to a certain degree um and they allowed her to establish this um teacher training school however it wasn't really a state official um so so in those cases yes they had to play the playing field and they had to go around and be like hey look we're not going to interfere with your male teachers. We're not going to interfere with, you can say, uh, the long established public traditions of education. However, we're going to just change some things here and there. So they had to play it safe. Of course, times changed um, and the politicians finally realized, hey, look, you know, we should um, it give these women more of a vote and a voice, especially in education. Education was always considered, you can say, the woman's domain um, for many, many years in Texas. <clears throat> yes, the first male colleges um, uh, were still prevalent. Where I went to undergrad at Austin College, Austin College was not, um, you know, basically did not allow uh, female students until the 1930s. Um, so when we talk about that divide, we talk about, yes, you know, male colleges were still prevalent. However, times changed. These uh, women suffragists, uh, especially after the suffrage movement, they still went in. They still turned the heads of the male politicians. And they finally, finally, hopefully, uh, you know, acknowledged that, hey, look, we're actually making some change. Uh, and hopefully we won't disturb you in that sense. Uh, and it worked, it worked. Um, and I'm very pleased it, that it worked. And still women politicians are slowly turning their heads to males. Hopefully, you know, campaigning and, um, it, you know, all those uh, peaceful protests because women still deserve the right to be paid equally as men. They still deserve the right to have the same academic and professional opportunities as males. So they're slowly turning their heads. Yes, uh, you know, it was a bad stigma in the beginning, especially when you look at the color of the color line. But at the same time, that has slowly begun getting better. It's really fascinating when you look at American history and you talk about American history. America is progressive, but it's a very slow progression. Um, and, uh, you know, I always say this to my students. It's a slow progression. America's the land of the free. But guess what? You know, you actually have to wait a couple of decades before you get your rights. You know, the immigrants and, uh, you know, the African-Americans and the Latinas, you have to wait a little bit before you get your rights, uh, which is, you know, ironic considering America was the land of the dreams, right? Um, it was the land where you could come from any other different culture and, um, you know, uh, traditions, but unfortunately you were judged upon um you know in the first couple of decades that you were there or the first generations um and then slowly america uh comes to play uh but uh, you could definitely say that they were playing the playing field safely yeah i'm reminded um as you're talking about this also that um, within the suffrage movement that white women did believe that their cause would be slowed down or crippled in some way if they were arguing for black women to have the right to vote. Um, and so you actually see national suffragist leaders who are distancing themselves from black women in the suffrage movement, which is very discouraging. Every time my students read about that, they just, you know, they, they can't wrap their brains around it. I think it's hard for all of us to wrap our brains around it. Wait a minute, you want justice for women, you want equality for women, and yet you're gonna leave a whole bunch of women out of that equation. Um, and it, and, but again, it's a painful and important reminder for us of how it worked. Um, and yeah, when, 
when suffrage, suffragists during the pro progressive era were arguing for the right to vote, they, they had this subtle shift, maybe not so subtle in some cases, from it's about equality to no, it really is about the differences between men and women. It's what women can bring to public policy. It's about what women can bring to government. It's, as you say, these women were arguing, we're gonna get in there, we're gonna clean everything up. Politics is corrupt and women aren't corrupt and women are gonna come in and make things better. Um, and women have certain issues that they really care about and that men are ignoring and that's what women will bring to the political process. And so they actually argued it would make them better wives and better mothers if they had the right to vote because they could do their job better if they had the right to vote and they could shape policy, um, which is really interesting. So we always think of it as an equality issue, but a lot of suffragists were actually talking about, no, it matters that I'm a woman and that I have the experiences that I have and I'm gonna bring that to the ballot box. Um, so it, it is fascinating to think about the arguments that they would use at different points in the movement to try to gain support. As you say, from different audiences, you have to cater your message to your audience to make sure you don't offend people or lose people, right? And I do think that that's still relevant today, for sure. You know, you kind of you kind of had to woo them in. You can say, especially you know, we're talking about uh, Caps, Blanton, Minnie Fisher, Cunningham when they approached uh, William Hobby. Um, you know, about this primary suffrage bill, they kind of had to flirt with him a little. He was the handsome gentleman in the room, um, and so he was like, "Oh, you know, these women, yeah." Uh, but at the same time, he knew it was a political game too, because he had their, you know, basically their voice in the house to turn their husbands' heads the right way. Um, so yeah, you kind of had to seduce them, you can say. Yeah, <laughs> that's amazing. Oh my goodness. So um, we will go ahead and wrap up. Um, and I wanna thank you again, say thank you again to our special guest, uh, Joshua Channon, uh, to our resident political scientists, Dr. McLennan and Dr. Monzo, to all of our attendees and our panelists, thank you so much for weighing in and for your questions. Uh, remember election day is November 3rd, early voting is going on now through October 31st. So make your voice heard, get your vote in, um, be a part of the system. Uh, thank you all again so much and have a wonderful day.